Well, uh, thank you all for coming out to this little box lunch discussion. I'm going to say, before I get started, I'm going to say a little bit about how it's going to go. Uh, we discovered that people seem to like having a short intro presentation to some issue and then having some time to sort of talk amongst themselves at the tables. So I'm going to give you a little 20 to 30 minute presentation on this issue that I'm, I'm very interested in. And then we're going to leave you with some focus questions. I'm going to leave you with two kinds of arguments to consider. Or really one is an argument to consider, another is a set of policy recommendations to consider. You'll have an opportunity to sort of talk amongst yourselves about those issues, but then what we'll probably do is for the last 10 minutes or so, uh, bring it back so if people did want to come and ask, wanted to get up and ask questions, they could, because I'm going to throw out an argument that I'm on the fence about, but leaning toward thinking is sound, and it just doesn't seem fair to throw up an argument that you're prepared to defend, not give people a chance to, to get up and, and challenge you on. So I'd like to give people that opportunity. So the topic today is the ethics of anonymity online. Before I get started, I want to note something that I think is just kind of ironic. Um, last night on Yik Yak, I posted this, uh, <clears throat> saying, hey, I'm going to be giving a talk at the Union Building tomorrow. Uh, come on out, blah, blah, blah. And then a student said, oh, great. May I say who the student is or no? I there, Alex. He came up to me just before the talk. And the student said, oh, great, I'm, I'm writing my, uh, I'm doing my senior seminar on um, trolling and anonymity online is a big sort of part of that sort of thing. And then the grand irony is just a few minutes later, we get an anonymous trolling comment, right? And uh, yik yak, it got voted down so much that it, it went off. But I just thought that was kind of ironic. I go to the online medium, I want to talk about ethics online, and within a few minutes, we get this kind of trolling, hateful comment. So anyway, enough about that. Let's get to it. So an outline of the talk. I'm going to say a little bit about what I think are the benefits of, or the pros, you might say, for participating in online communities. And my focus really will be that, on focusing on communities, social networks, environments that allow people to interact with each other in a kind of anonymous fashion. I'm going to focus on a few what I think are the benefits of those kinds of communities. And then I'm going to say a little bit, actually quite a lot, spoiler alert, I think there are more cons to these kinds of online communities. So we're going to spend more time talking about the cons. And then the, what I really want to leave you with are two sort of food for thought kinds of things. One is an argument that I've been kicking around uh, as I said, I'm not so sure about the soundness of it, but I think it's worth our attention. And I'm going to give you an argument for why I think it might be, in most cases, morally wrong for people to be participants in these kinds of online communities. And I'm going to give you a little thought experiment to kind of motivate you and prime you for a kind of argument by analogy. And then I'm going to talk about a series, briefly just present a kind of bulleted list of policy recommendations, things in which I think our nation as a whole is sort of falling behind on sort of mitigating the effects, the negative effects of these online communities, and I'm going to offer up some, some policy recommendations for us to think about. So that's the sort of structure of the talk, so let's get to it. There are really two main, I think, benefits to participating in online communities, that, that these things exist, two benefits for their existence. One is that members of vulnerable groups get a voice, right? So if you are from a racial or ethnic minority or from some kind of group that's subject to a lot of harassment, uh, it's really empowering to be able to come out to these kinds of places and speak your mind and get a kind of voice that you otherwise might not get because if you try to have that voice in a much more public setting with a name attached to your views, you might be subject to harassment in the real world. And so there really is something empowering and liberating about being able to participate in these kinds of communities. So that's one, I think, very big positive thing to these kinds of online communities. <clears throat> kind of counterpart to that and related to that is it's it's a way for very powerful groups to get challenged, right? If, if there's something that you think needs to be addressed, but the act of addressing it and tying your name to it might subject you to an enormous amount of negative pushback from a very powerful group, well, then there's some benefit to being able to do this online. 
So um, let's see, just an example. We'll take whistleblowers, for example. Whistleblowers are sort of a paradigm case where you'd like to be able to have an outlet for people to say, hey, this is wrong, but the mere act of coming forward and saying, hey, this is wrong, might subject them to enormous retaliation. If they could just get that stuff out anonymously, you might think there's some benefit to that. Um, so those are two, I think, very, very good reasons that you might want for having these kinds of anonymous outlets online. But there's a very, very deep, dark side to these kinds of communities. And I think that the, despite the benefits, the, the dark side of this uh, should give us some pause and might actually lead us to think that we should actually rethink our own participation in these kinds of communities. So, this is Anita Sarkeesian. For those of you who don't know Anita Sarkeesian or know of her, she's a pretty remarkable character. Two years ago, she did a Kickstarter campaign to talk about violence against women in video games, or really not violence against women in video games, portrayal of women generally in video games. And she was trying to raise something in the neighborhood of, I think, $5,000. Well, within a very short period of time, she raised $150,000. And she did this really interesting series talking about the ways in which women are portrayed in video games, and also some discussion about how that might actually negatively impact women in our society. Well, it didn't take long for her to be the subject of massive uh, retaliation online. And if you're familiar with the hashtag Gamergate that just came to fruition a few months ago, that's a kind of remnant of this thing that she started about two years ago. And, shameless plug, I'm excited to say that Anita Sarkeesian will be here in April at the Gun Undergraduate Ethics Symposium talking about the, the theme of the symposium is value and virtue, sorry, vir uh, value in virtual spaces. Uh, and she's one of our keynote speakers, and her talk will be public, so I encourage you to come out and see what she has to say about some of the harassment that she's been experiencing as a result of that. And the harassment that she's been experiencing has actually been pretty severe. If you just go to the Feminist Frequency Twitter account, you'll see her detail the multitude of death threats, rape threats. She actually had to vacate her house for a while because she felt so scared. Um, and what we're seeing is uh, a columnist from Reuters noted that we are basically now living in the golden age of death threats. It used to be to, to send someone a death threat, there was a certain kind of risk or cost to you, right? If you were doing it from the phone, there was a chance that they could trace it to the phone and you would have left some physical trace. If you were sending a letter, it would be postmarked. And there's some chance that you left some trace that would let us figure out who it is that you really are. And the internet has largely changed that. And we're starting to see an enormous increase in the amount of death threats. And one of the interesting things that some people are, you might even make this a kind of civil rights issue, is that um, women and ethnic minorities are disproportionately the target of these kinds of threats. So it's often women who speak out online who then get to be subject to these nasty threats. And we're seeing just a much, much higher rate of these kinds of things. So that's one kind of negative, severe consequence of anonymity online. And some people argue that it may even threaten the democratic process, that if people can't feel people people can't feel free to speak their mind, or if they speak their mind about a controversial issue, suddenly have to worry about all these kinds of death threats, it can have a kind of chilling effect on the kinds of deliberation you might think we want in place for our democracy. <clears throat> it isn't just death threats, though. Uh, a kind of common tactic with these anonymous threats online are uh, it's a kind of targeted career sabotage. And I just want to read uh, a passage from Danielle Citron, who wrote a book called uh, Hate Crimes in Cyberspace. And by the way, it's a fantastic book. Uh, she's a law professor, and this book details the extent and the damage of online cyber harassment. And then she goes on to make some policy recommendations. Actually, many of those policy recommendations are ones that I'm going to talk about here at the end of this. So, let me just give you the background. This is an example of someone who was subject to massive uh, harassment. During the summer of 2008, Anna Mayer was getting ready to begin her first semester in graduate school. In her spare time, she wrote a pseudonymous blog about her weight struggles, body acceptance, and other personal issues. She enjoyed interacting with her readers and commenting on other blogs. It provided a support system and a sounding board for her ideas. 
Before school began, she searched her name and found posts describing her as a stupid, ugly, fat whore who, quote, couldn't take a hint from a man. Anonymous posters listed her email address, phone number, and dating profile sites. She received emails warning the authors knew where she lived. Posters outed her as the author of her pseudonymous blog. I'm going to continue. Over the next few years, the attacks grew more gruesome and numerous. Posters claimed that she had bipolar disorder and a criminal record for exposing herself in public. Racist comments she never made were attributed to her. Posts listed her professor's email addresses, instructing readers to tell them about Mayer's sickening racist rants. Someone set up a Twitter account in Mayer's name that claimed she fantasized about rape. Hundreds of posts were devoted to attacking her. Later, she secures a one-year fellowship with a nonprofit organization. Shortly after she began working, Post falsely accused her of having been fired from jobs due to her sexual misconduct. The name of her supervisor appeared next to the suggestion that she needs to be told nasty things. All right, I'll stop. That's, I think that's a good enough picture, or a bad enough picture, of just how nasty it gets. And what they're doing <coughs> It's not just death threats, but they're trying to affect people's careers. They're trying to ensure that they're just cut out of the marketplace entirely. And I'll say something about why I think this is actually very worrisome. You might say, well, would anyone really take that kind of stuff seriously? And I'm going to say something about that here in a second. But let me get to another one. Another kind of negative side effect to online communities that are, allow this kind of anonymity is it allows for a certain thing that you might call epistemic warfare. So the powers that be, I'm not, sorry, I'm going to sound like I'm sort of big brother threatening here, but the powers that be kind of love online communities because they allow a certain kind of practice. There's actually well-documented cases of private security firms who will actually advise governments on how to do things like create sock puppet accounts. Sock puppet accounts are where you can sort of take hundreds and thousands of anonymous online profiles and sort of have one person controlling all of these things at once, and one person can really shape the direction of a comment thread. So if there's something, if you want to shift the direction of an online discussion, if you have access to one of these kinds of uh, sock puppet accounts, there's a pretty easy way that you can do this. So there are ways for the powers that be to use these anonymous communities to their advantage. And here's a really interesting one. Companies can use them to sort of manipulate what appears to be the consensus of the community. And Yik Yak is actually guilty of this. So something that Yik Yak does, they created an algorithm that automatically downvotes any mention of a competitor. So a competitor to Yik Yak is this site called Unseen. And if you post just the word Unseen to Yik Yak, after the first minute it gets a downvote, after the second minute it gets a downvote, it gets a downvote every five minutes. And once it gets five downvotes, Yik Yak has a program to have it automatically removed. Anything that gets five downvotes that quickly gets removed from Yik Yak, at least that's my understanding. Yik Yak has actually admitted to having done this when they got caught doing this. I actually tested it a couple of weeks ago, and I actually tested it just uh, about an hour ago just to see if it was still in place. And sure enough, if you just write the word unseen in a post, it gets downvoted. But now, Yik Yak has sort of promised us that what this environment is supposed to be doing is giving you the anonymous consensus of the crowd, right? Sort of wisdom of the crowds. But when this kind of stuff happens anonymously, and, and you set it up in a way where it's difficult to detect malfeasance, uh, you get this opportunity for people with the kind of power and control to manipulate the message you're getting. And make you think you're getting a message that reflects a broad consensus of the community, when in fact it's not. It's a few people manipulating it to try and give you the illusion of some kind. All right. So, you might think, well, what's the big deal, right? I mean, do people, aren't people sensible? Don't they really have good sense to not trust anonymous content, uh, to not really give it much credence? Would, would an employer, in Anna Meyer's case, really do something um, or, or really respond to those anonymous content, 
comments and, and take it seriously. And there's actually two interesting studies that I, I hope will surprise you. Um, one is this. They've <clears throat> surveyed people who read blogs, and they've asked to sort of rate the credibility of various things that they read. And what they found is that there's actually very little difference uh, in the credence people are willing to place in a blog post based on whether or not the person uses a real name or not. So you might think, oh, we're, we're real good. We're not going to put a whole lot of credence in a post that's anonymous. But the data suggests otherwise. The data suggests that you are just as likely to, to, uh, <coughs> to believe something posted from an anonymous writer as opposed to not. Here's another interesting um, bit of information. Uh, there have been studies that suggest that the, the content in anonymous comment threads will actually affect people's perception of the quality of the original post. So they'll take a post, some, some argument for something or other, for some policy recommendation, and then they'll have a bunch of people read it, and then they'll say, you know, how good do you think the argument was? And it'll get some rating. Um, on a scale of 1 to 10, let's just assume for ease of exposition that it's a 9. So they, they rated it a 9 average. And then they take that same post and they show it to a bunch of other people, but they include a bunch of inflammatory comments. And I'm not even talking about responding to the argument. They're saying things like, no one would trust an idiot like you, you know, fuck you, whatever. They just say nasty things, and that's it. And what they've noticed is that they asked those people who read the anonymous, nasty, and completely irrelevant comment threads, and they actually downgrade the quality of the argument of the original poster's posts. So people are significantly influenced by nasty, anonymous comments. And people don't take into account the fact that someone's posting anonymously, or they typically don't take into account the fact that someone's posting anonymously as some reason to sort of pull back and maybe examine this a little further. Now I want to just shift gears for just a minute, and I want to consider these pros and cons, and I want to argue that it's going to give us a kind of um, reason, a prima facie reason, to think that we should at least rethink our involvement in some of these anonymous online communities. And to begin with, I want to give you a little thought experiment. So we're going to imagine, we're going to pretend for a moment, that Canada has decided to become completely anonymous. And what they've decided is that all citizens have agreed, we're all going to put on our black box masks, and we're just going to interact with each other completely anonymously. That, that's how we're going to, there's benefits to anonymity in our interactions, so we're just going to have a completely anonymous society. And let's say they did this. But now, let's say that people start to realize, hey, this is kind of nice. We're all behaving anonymously. It, it will protect me from various bad behaviors. And let's say Canada started like running raids into the you know northern Minnesota or into Montana and started doing this kind of stuff. And you know we started saying, whoa, whoa, whoa slow down, but like, like, uh, you ought to stop this. And they said, well, we're, we're just we're completely anonymous. We have no control over what the other people do. We're a sort of we're a lawless, anonymous society. What what can we do now? In a situation like that, um, I'd imagine that we would be, to some extent, justified in doing something about that. So let me just give you an example. When you've got a nation, and there are groups within that nation who are acting aggressively, and the people who are allegedly in charge of that nation say things like, we have no control over what they do, uh, the common reply is, then you're not a sovereign nation. And if you're not a sovereign nation, you know, someone else can come in and rectify the situation that you yourself claim to not to be able to control. Um, and you might think, now, now I want to add to this scenario. Uh, you might think, uh, imagine that the citizens of anonymous Canada had alternative options available to them. So there were other, they could, imagine we're in a society, imagine we're in a world where land is just kind of limitless. And they could just, if they didn't, you know, they could just get up and move to some other land and create some society that preserved the benefits of anonymity without any of these negative consequences, right? They're not, let's say they're not limited by the restrictions of real property to do something like this. 
you might start to wonder if the people who agree to participate in this kind of environment, who agree to participate in a community where there are no rules and there are no uh, ways to redress grievances, there's no system of justice or policing in place at all, you might think that the what you would have thought are innocent participants of this environment really aren't that innocent after all, that they're somehow culpable for con contributing and sustaining a society like that, and that there may actually be something wrong with their participation in that society. So now I want to give you the argument, and I want to see what you all, you know, we're going to have some Q, we're going to have some discussion about it at the tables, but I hope there's some time for Q&A. But here's roughly what I'm thinking, and I'm not certain I endorse this argument, but I do think it's an argument worth our consideration. So, first premise of the argument. It would be morally wrong to participate as a citizen in a country like Anonymous Canada that met the following three conditions. Obviously attracted and shielded people who abuse anonymity tack wrongly. So it's sort of obvious to you that one of the benefits of what one of the things that's happening is it's attracting people who want to use the shield of anonymity that you created for them to do bad things. That's got to be one thing. The system would have absolutely no place, there'd be no sort of system of justice for redress of grievances. So you, the, the country or whatever has decided we're just not going to police any kind of wrongdoing whatsoever. Just gonna, can't do anything about it. And um, if there were viable alternatives that preserved the benefits of anonymity, so if there was some way to get those benefits without um, uh, doing any of this nasty stuff, or there were these viable alternatives. If, if I, the claim is it would be wrong to agree to participate in a society like that. Now, if you think that's true, and I'm not certain I think that's true, I just think it's, it's got a little bit of plausibility to, to me at least. For many people, there's probably no morally relevant difference between Anonymous Canada and actual online communities, perhaps Anonymous and Yip Yap. Particularly people who are just sort of passively involved, helping the community thrive, and just using it for entertainment purposes. Maybe there are really, really good reasons to be participating in an online uh, environment that's anonymous for the purposes of you're one of those vulnerable groups and you want a voice, or there's some grave injustice and you're fearful of retribution and you just need to you need to get the information out there. There are going to be people for whom you might think that's okay, but if it's just purely entertainment purposes and you're you're causally contributing to sustaining a community and you could you could get the benefits of that somewhere else, maybe somewhere where it wasn't as easy to be so covert. You might think for those people, there's not much of a morally relevant difference between a country like Anonymous Canada and some of these online communities. So I think what we have is a prima facie case to think that for many people, it might actually be wrong to participate in these online communities. So that's, that's the argument in a nutshell. I'm going to ask you all to consider that at your tables, and then we can have maybe a little Q&A about it later. But now I want to shift gears to one other thing as a kind of food for thought for everyone. The other thing is to talk about some, some practical policy recommendations that you might implement to mitigate the damage that can be caused by online communities that are anonymous. And let me just uh, preface this by saying I'm not even certain that I would endorse all of these policy recommendations. This is just a list of things that have been proposed and I think they merit our consideration. So one of them is you might think that we ought to start allowing people to sue under pseudonyms. Because a lot of times what happens is people won't combat nasty behavior, particularly nasty behavior um, online, if, they, if their name is going to be a matter of public record in the lawsuit, and then they would just be subject to further harassment. Right? The thing they're trying to combat is this kind of harassment. But the, the only way they can actually address that is to subject themselves to precisely the thing they're trying to combat. And so some people have suggested, well, perhaps we ought to allow people who are victims of cyber harassment to sue under some kind of pseudonym, so there would just be no public record. Now, that's going to be controversial, because you might think it's like fighting anonymity with anonymity, right? And, and, or you might think that one of the fundamental tenets of justice is that, that people have a kind of right to face their accuser. That's just, just a long-standing tradition in law that people have that kind of right. But you might think, well, <laughs> people have a right to face their accuser, but we have a system now where, at least socially, people can't face the people who are accusing them because anonymity is shielding them. 
So you might think there's a kind of trade-off. If you think free speech and expression is so important that people can be harassed anonymously, well, then maybe we ought to rethink the notion that people can't be sued anonymously as well. So it's just kind of trade-off. Um, you could think, you could recommend some kind of mandator, mandatory ID policies, make it basically impossible for any online community to let people um, operate without it being possible to trace it back to who they are. <clears throat> I think some other interesting suggestions would be to exclude certain kinds of websites, and this is one that's suggested by Danielle Citron, exclude certain kinds of websites from what's called, from Section 230 immunity from the uh, Communications Decency Act, which was passed in 1996. So the Communications Decency Act puts sort of uh, certain kinds of requirements for communication, and if it's, there's certain kinds of speech online that would be regarded as illegal and you could suffer penalties for engaging in it. But Section 230 granted immunity to certain kinds of websites. Websites that say, we are just, we create the venue for people to post, but we ought not be held liable for anything that's posted there. And in those kinds of sites get what's called Section 230 immunity. And um, it's fairly easy to get immunity from the kinds of things that people post. And different nations have different levels to which they, they grant immunity to these kinds of sites. But one option would be to restrict in some way the kind of immunity a content provider or one of these kind of social media sites might have with this kind of Section 230 immunity. And where it seems clearest is when the purpose is to engage in illegal behavior. So certain kinds of communities that actually encourage cyber stalking or actually encourage what's called revenge porn, it's where you sort of post naked photos of an ex or something like that to shame the ex if they've done something you don't like. And, and websites actually sort of, it's not like just a bulletin board where sort of anything goes. There are websites that actually the site exists just so people can engage in this kind of illegal behavior. You might think those kinds of sites ought not get Section 230 immunity. Um, <coughs> you might also have, sorry, possible exceptions for other kinds of behavior. You might think that maybe we ought to hold sites accountable for libel, slander. Libel's the written one, right? Yeah. Um, for libel. Um, <coughs> so that's an, that's an opportunity to sort of mitigate the effects of negative behavior online, particularly the kinds of behavior that's illegal. A third kind of, or a fourth kind of restriction is you might place restrictions on hiring laws, right? You might think that perhaps we ought to not allow online searches, or if when people are hiring people, not allow online searches of those people because they might find those nasty anonymous comments, or if you do allow online searches, maybe you have to require disclosure that like, hey, we, we didn't hire you, and during the hiring process, we did a search, and here's a list of the things we found about you, right? So at least a kind of disclosure uh, of those kinds of practices, and maybe even an opportunity for, if there are negative things that come up, a required opportunity for people to address any negative things that were posted about them in any kind of site. Just give them some kind of power to respond to these things that are likely being held against them. Another opportunity for addressing this kind of stuff would be to treat social media sites the way we treat credit reporting agencies. So if you miss a bill, uh, the, the person you owe the money to will report that to some kind of credit reporting agency, and then it's a blemish on your credit, and other people can just go and find that out. But there are uh, certain kinds of regulations and restrictions, right? And, and consumers have rights. To, to not have false or misleading information in their credit report history. Well, you might think that there's an opportunity here to model the Fair Credit Reporting Act for some kind of Fair Reputation Reporting Act, and any agency that views itself as a harborer of information, like a credit reporting agency, uh, in this case a social media site, maybe they ought to be liable to certain kinds of Fair Reputation Reporting Acts. And the structure of that could take many different kinds of facets, but something like that is an opportunity to, to try and mitigate some of the damage caused here. All right, last one. Um, we started this talk with the anonymity online about the kinds of death threats um, that are now made possible via anonymous sites. And one of the difficult things about death threats is they're illegal, but they're illegal um, and, and punishable only if they meet
meet certain very stringent criteria. The person has to reasonably believe that the person intends to kill them. The threat has to be imminent, right? And the, the difficulty with anonymous online death threats is you just have no barometer. You, you, don't, you don't have any way of getting, you don't know who it's coming from. You don't know how serious they might be. And so there's this question. It almost seems quasi all or nothing, right? <laughs> do, do we treat it as not really a threat at all? Uh, and then really it's not punishable? Or do we just treat, do we have some kind of policy where we just treat every single death threat as serious and eminent? And if we treated every single death threat as serious and eminent that happened online, then if you were found to have, even in a joking manner, uh, offered up some kind of death threat, the consequences could be pretty severe. So that's another kind of option. Now, among these options, I'm not sure which, if any, I'm really favoring. I'm sort of, this is a kind of very interesting new territory for me, and I just encourage us all to sort of think about these two focus questions. So one is, let's think about our participation in anonymous online communities. Is it really something that we should be a part of if it's not serving some really weighty goal of ours? Right? We're just doing it for entertainment purposes. We're doing it for the lulls, so to speak. And the second one is, should any of the suggestions that were recommended, or I didn't recommend, um, any of the suggestions listed up there be something that we ought to take seriously as implementing as a matter of public policy? 